and his teaching and research explore how resources from the Catholic theological tradition can help people make better ethical decisions in their ordinary lives. In addition to his work with the theology department, where he is the director of undergraduate studies, so I asked him about a theology major. He is also the current director of the Marquette Core Curriculum. Pope Francis's newly released comments in support of civil unions for same-sex couples has caused quite a stir. In this soup of substance, Dr. Connor Kelly will explore the broader context behind the Pope's comments, linking these newsworthy quotes to the Pope's earlier positions as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires and situating the Pope's position in relation to the larger Catholic theological tradition in order to explain the significance of the pronouncement for the Catholic Church. So I'm going to turn things on to Connor Kelly, and if everyone can mute themselves, please. Thanks a lot, Amanda. It's good to be here with all of you, and I'd love to see your faces, even if you're having some lunch. I won't be offended if you're willing to turn on a camera. I'd be happy to see the people, but I understand how things go. Um, basically, I'm going to try my best to give some kind of context how I read the Pope's comments as a theologian and as an ethicist, and I'd hopefully like to give plenty of time for conversation so you can throw things in the chat or we'll have moments, I think, at the end. Um, to kind of mine where this goes. So I will do my best not to be talking forever, um, but I'm also a professor and have a tendency to ramble. So I'll do my, as I say, do my level best here. As those of you who are coming to this probably already know, uh, Pope Francis was quoted as saying he gave support to civil unions, uh, that's to say same-sex civil unions, which caused quite a stir when it was announced last week. And the quote that's been gathering attention in full came from this film, a documentary called Francesco by a rather influential documentarian named Evgeny Avenisky. And he was basically doing a whole documentary about Pope Francis's efforts to promote justice in the world and sort of as an advocate for positive social change consistent with kind of Catholic social teaching and these values. Um, Avenisky is not Catholic. He's kind of, I think if I remember correctly, about as an atheist, but was kind of fascinated by what Pope Francis was doing and the the good that he was achieving in his pontificate. And so he kind of started this documentary and uh, looks at the Pope's efforts to address poverty, both in the immediate vicinity of the Vatican and Rome and also globally. Um, some of the Pope's travels and the, the things that have come out of those you know, airplane conversations. And then he had access to footage in the Vatican archives and he pulled this quote from an interview that Pope Francis had done with um, a reporter from Televisa in Mexico, uh, and her name was Valentina Alizraki. And so this is a uh, technically old footage. It came out, I believe, in May 2019, or it was in that interview, but it was actually not publicly released. The way that the Vatican does interviews like that is that the Vatican press office records the interview that somebody does with the Pope if it happens at the Vatican. And then they give the footage to the broadcaster who's going to broadcast it and then the broadcaster does whatever they're going to do to edit it and then it gets simultaneously published by the broadcaster in the vatican but when the vatican released footage from the interview to the broadcaster televisa they had edited out the segment where pope francis gave these comments so there was some initial questioning about like where is this coming from um, so it was not a comment that pope francis gave directly to the documentary maker even afaniski it was a comment that came in a, an earlier interview, and that becomes important for interpreting some of what he's saying in terms of the broader context. Because um, you hear a quote from Pope Francis, but the quote was in response to certain questions in an original interview. Um, but the quote itself is, as it appears in the, in the movie, homosexual people have a right to be in a family. They are children of God and have a right to a family. Nobody should be thrown out or be made miserable over it. What we have to create is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. I supported that. Now, that in itself um, generates a lot of different questions, obviously. And it struck folks as a big deal, particularly in like a US context where the Catholic Church through the Catholic bishops of the United States has been kind of at the forefront of pushing questions around gay marriage and challenging those efforts in court and in other avenues and sort of been the most vociferous uh, around that. So the Pope suggesting support for same-sex civil unions is a pretty big deal in that context. 
in isolation, the quote can be in a variety of different things. So what I was thinking is that I would kind of walk through the different pieces of it and discuss the sort of how they range on not a big deal to really a big deal and kind of process that and then give some larger context. So first on the not such a big deal side of things, we have his quote about how gay people have a right to be in a family and are children of God. Frankly, this shouldn't really be a contestable claim for a Catholic or for a Christian or for anyone else. Everyone is a child of God and the Catholic Church affirms the inherent dignity of all humans created in the image and likeness of God and a gay or lesbian Catholic or non-Catholic is no different. Everybody is a child of God and deserves to have that dignity recognized. And so the idea of a right to be in a family and the fact that nobody should be thrown out over, presumably he says it, but presumably he means their sexual orientation, really is reinforcing what the Catholic Church teaches about the importance of the family. So the Catholic Church through the Second Vatican Council, articulates the family as the primary cell of society. It's where we are formed as human beings to have our kind of moral consciences, to have our sense of our relationship to other humans, our social ability, to have our sense of our relationship with God. These are all things that we learn as human beings in a family context. And the Catholic Church, recognizing that, gives really high value to family and to parenthood. And so what he's saying in that sense is really love your children, parents, whether they're gay or straight or whoever your child is, love your child. And that really is a, a fundamentally, I think, easy win for the Catholic Church and for everybody. We should all be able to say that. And the truth is, we've not always been able to say that as a number of uh, children who are gay or lesbian have recognized in their own experience. They've had the challenges of bringing their true identity to their family, to their parents in particular. And this is a kind of breath of fresh air, positively in that sense. So I say not a big deal in the controversial sense of it, but a big deal in the affirmation that it provides and the reinforcement that these broader Catholic teachings about the dignity of all apply to all. There's no excuses, there's no conditions, there's no exceptions. And that actually is a big deal and that's important. And it really don't wanna lose sight of that fact because there are plenty of people who do not feel that affirmation for their own selves and need to, especially in a family. Second, the thing that I think would probably be the biggest deal from all of the quote would be the part where he says they have a right to a family. So the first line is they have a right to be in a family, which is to say you should not be thrown out of your family for your sexual orientation. They have a right to a family begins to sound like an affirmation of adoption rights, for instance. And this one, would be a bigger deal because it ends up being a, a major intervention in the way that, say, the Catholic Church in the United States talks about um, adoption for gay couples. Right now, there's, uh, I think it's a Catholic Charities organization, I believe in Pennsylvania, that is party to a case that's about to go before the Supreme Court where they've challenged the uh, requirement that they would consider same-sex couples for adoptions. And so you have Catholic-sponsored adoption agencies that are either no longer doing adoptions because they don't want to be required to place children in their adoption system in same-sex households, or are actively litigating to avoid having to do that so that they can continue placing children in heterosexual couples. If that's kind of the framing that the Pope is giving, then that would be a pretty big deal. It would be a direct challenge to that lawsuit fund and other things like that. And it would give a lot less teeth to the objections that some of these Catholic charities and other organizations, other adoption agencies are, are putting forward about the restrictions on their ability to do their work. But this is going to be likely disappointing to some. It does not seem that that's actually what Pope Francis is saying. So in the original footage, and there's a transcription that was available now from that initial interview. Both parts of that, they have a right to be in a family, they have a right to a family, came in response to a question where the interviewer was asking him about the kind of broader issue of discernment and accompaniment that came out of Pope Francis's document Amoris Laetitia in the aftermath of the Synod on the Family, which stressed the need to really see the church walk alongside people in a variety of different circumstances. And he responded by pointing to a response that he'd given in an interview, I believe flying back from Ireland, where 
someone had asked him, or a reporter had asked him, what would you say to a family where the parents have just found out that their child is gay? And he basically says sort of what he's paraphrased here. Children of God, inherent dignity, there's no reason to stop loving your child. And if you have a challenge, if you have a problem with this as a parent, then seek out the help that you need to love your child more fundamentally, more fully. And both parts of that quote, they have a right to be in a family, they have a right to a family, no one should be thrown out over it, were really designed to capture what he was saying in response to that specific question. So from that framing, it seems less like an affirmation of, say, adoption for same-sex couples as it is a reinforcement of the value of dignity. And that you know, leaves open the kind of lawsuits and challenges that some of the Catholic organizations are doing in the United States. At the same time, the direct quote of what he says is somewhat ambiguous. So it does leave open the, the curiosity, shall we say, and I'm going to be interested to see how this plays out in, say, that Supreme Court case when people start to point to this quote and say, well, look, here's what Pope Francis is saying. Can you really stand so strongly against this requirement? And may not have the ability to do that quite as effectively as they would have, say, a week ago. Um, the larger element is that it would be a pretty big shift for Pope Francis as an individual if that were the position that he were taking here based on some of the other things that he said, both in written documents as Pope and in public interviews. He's, for instance, um, even in Amoris Laetitia, challenged what he calls gender ideology. Um, and has reinforced the Catholic position on gender complementarity, and that's importance in families, and so has overtly indicated that he sees a kind of high value in having parents of um, uh, heterosexual parents. So given all of that, it would be pretty shocking if he had meant to say, well, we really need to have protections for same-sex adoption. But given the other things that he's saying about civil unions and legal protections there, that would seem to be the next domino, right? The logical extension of legal protections would include the legal protection to adopt. So there is some ambiguity, but I, I would not say that it's this kind of clear, convincing word. And given his previous statements, you'd probably need a little bit more overt reference to, to make that case, I would say. Finally, the quote that I think probably is the biggest deal across the board is his comments about how we have to create a civil union law. And it's both a big deal and not a big deal um, in context. So let me kind of walk through that. As you are probably aware, in the United States, this the question of gay marriage is a kind of culture war issue. And the Catholic Church has often been on the forefront of this culture war, has sort of seized the, the warrior mentality of it, particularly through the US bishops, and has made it something of a priority. What this quote does is begin to challenge that priority a little bit, which, as I'll talk about in a moment, is kind of consistent with some of the other things Pope Francis has tried to say about what our priorities are as a church. The other reason that it's a big deal is not just how the Catholic bishops have in the United States have kind of responded to the legal shifting around gay marriage, but because of the way that the Catholic Church as an institution has its own kind of position on legal recognition for same-sex unions. And the guiding document for this is a document released by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is this Vatican office that is responsible for articulating the basically applications of Catholic teaching and Catholic values into specific questions. So bishops can write to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and basically say, we're dealing with this challenge, this question, in our immediate context, what would the church want us to do institutionally across the board? And so this leads to documents about, say, assisted reproductive technologies in the sphere of bioethics, which is one of the avenues where I do some teaching. You see sort of changes in technology, new things arise, new opportunities. And so bishops write saying, hey, we're not quite sure what to make of this. This technology could sort of go in a couple different directions. What do we say? And then the CDF gets theologians and others uh, bishops together, and they write a document that basically says, here's how we would apply existing Catholic teaching to this new question. So in 2003, they did a document saying, here's how we're going to apply existing Catholic teaching to the question of legal recognition for same-sex unions. That would have, in that context, been both civil union laws and gay marriage laws. And what they kind of came out and said was, look, this is not going to be a surprise to anybody. <laughs> uh, the Catholic Church is opposed to legal recognition for 
same sex unions um, sort of vociferously against legal recognition that would equate to marriage based on the understanding of gender complementarity and the understanding of human sexuality as ordained to this kind of union of a man and woman as husband and wife and also the procreation of children. So there's in the background the kind of Catholic sexual teaching and then they interpret the application of that to civil law by saying, look, this message sort of needs to be protected. Marriage needs to be protected. That was the framework, at least of mind in the, the document. And because the CDF is this group that represents the Vatican, it's, it's sort of the teaching arm of the Vatican, a position like that really is the official position of the Catholic Church. Some denominations do not have a centralized teaching authority in the same way, but for the Catholic Church, there is a hierarchy and a message like that from the from the Vatican, and not just the Vatican generally, but from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, holds this weight. It's like, this is the official position. And in that document, one of the things that they say is, and here's the quote I wanted to give you, in those situations where homosexual unions, and this is always the language that they use, um, have been legally recognized or have been given the legal status and rights belonging to marriage, and this is what they say, clear and emphatic opposition is a duty. So they were saying to the bishops, you have a duty to oppose this. They're also saying to ordinary Catholics, you have a duty to challenge this, vote against this in a democracy, that kind of thing. Pope Francis's language, frankly, challenges that position. And th th anybody who would kind of challenge, suggest otherwise is, is being somewhat disingenuous um, at the end of the day. Th the whole document is really about, in their language, Necessary to oppose legal recognition of homosexual unions. So they do make some distinctions between different types of laws. And this is something that Pope Francis is certainly trading on. But Pope Francis says, quote, what we have to create is civil, a civil union law is definitely a challenge to the idea that it is always necessary to oppose any kind of legal status for homosexual unions or same-sex relationships. And that, as I say, is kind of a big deal. It's also not quite as big of a deal as it might initially seem for a couple of different reasons. So first, to be clear, Pope Francis's comments are about civil unions, and he has a pretty clear distinction in mind between a civil union and gay marriage. So in a context like the United States, following what Pope Francis has in mind would require changing the laws as we have them now in a post Obergefell um, context in the US, for instance. And this distinction is very clearly highlighted in his um, original interview with the Televisa reporter in 2019, from which this quote came, because he's, he's the longer quote is saying, I've always defended doctrine, which would be these larger claims about um, Catholic sexual teaching and also some of the applications to marriage. And then he says, and it is curious about the law on homosexual marriage. Again, this is his language. It is a contradiction to speak of homosexual marriage. But what we have to create is, is, is a civil union law. So in the immediate context of what he says that shows up in the documentary, he's very clearly trying to say a civil union is different from marriage, and that's important, and that distinction holds a lot of weight for him. And so in that sense, nothing about what the church teaches on marriage is affected by his comments on civil unions. Second, the other reason this might not be such a big deal is to think about the rationale that he's giving. He says, that way they are legally covered. I stood up for that or I defended that. The part where he says I stood up for that seems to be a reference to his work as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, where in Argentina in the early 2000s, there was a referendum to um, legalize gay marriage. And he it had been long rumored, came out to the bishops, his fellow bishops, and said, look, I think what we should do is that we should come out in support of civil unions. We should craft a space for civil unions for same-sex couples so that it's not the same thing as marriage and then marriage gets reserved for heterosexual couples. This was not sort of his broad public position because his fellow bishops did not like that strategy and just wanted to say, no, we're going to be in opposition across the board. So it was never entirely clear that he had actually taken this position, but it was sort of widely rumored and in some cases widely accepted to be the case. So when, according to the reporters for Televisa, when they did not get the um, quote about civil unions and the you know larger question of how parents should respond to gay children, 
in their footage back from the Vatican. They didn't bother asking for it because, according to them, they didn't think it was a big deal. They felt like this was already Pope Francis's position, and so it, he was just restating things that were already known. But obviously, as we've seen in the aftermath of the documentary, not quite known to the same extent, and certainly that would be the case. Um, but if you think about that in the context of I supported that and him sort of referencing his experience as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, what he seems to be saying really is I supported that in order to make some of this difference between marriage as a heterosexual institution and civil unions as a legal kind of protection. He's also saying the kind of rationale is to provide that legal protection. And what he's worried about is the ways that human dignity is not being honored. So think about what marriage conveys in terms of legal rights, say, in the United States. It provides kind of by de facto law an immediate right of survivorship for a spouse. So if you have not crafted a will, then your spouse has legal rights to all the things that belong to you after you die, unless you've specified somebody else. That's kind of the way that it would go. Whereas if you are not given the protections of marriage and you're in a long-standing relationship, heterosexual or homosexual relationship, or otherwise, you're going to have this ambiguity about what happens with your things. So there's the kind of like um, common law marriage idea of, well, this couple's been together for a long time and so we can treat them that way, but it's not guaranteed the same way. And certainly same-sex couples would have found plenty of times that the law was not giving them those those opportunities to make that case um, or actively prevented it. Um, then you can think about something like hospital visitation policies or power of attorney in terms of healthcare. Again, the assumption in the law is your next of kin, which is your spouse, would have those kinds of rights. But in the absence of um, a civil union law or gay marriage, then if you have a same sex couple, those rights are not accorded. And then the one that I think is really important and kind of as clearest in the US context would be access to healthcare. So a lot of times healthcare is driven through employment, as we know in the US, and companies, employers offer access to spouses as kind of like nice benefit pro family policy, usually as it's articulated in these terms, um, or an employment retention policy. But then um, you often have to show a marriage certificate or something like that. I mean, this came up even in the context of Marquette just a, a year ago when the vendor we used to validate all these different things shifted. And so everybody had to bring a marriage certificate and all these other um, documents. You had to show birth certificates for your kids and, and everything. And in the absence of a legal protection, then you can't demonstrate those things. And you'd be in a place where a an employer might say, no, I, I'm not going to give um, healthcare access to your your spouse because I I don't recognize you can't show me the legal document for it. Um, so this idea of legal protections is really about honoring dignity, about saying, look, there are plenty of ways that our current legal structures can dehumanize people in same sex relationships and can leave men and women unprotected in the case of something like healthcare or in the case of um, inheritance, rights of survivorship, these other things. So what do we do? And he says, well, let's have a law. Let's have a law that recognizes and protects people and ensures that those opportunities are available. So in this notion, he's kind of making an argument that this law is really about dignity and it's about protecting the dignity of the human being. And so this would be really quite consistent with what the Catholic Church is teaching, even in that document that I referenced from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. One of the things that they say is it's important to present what they call the whole moral truth. And they suggest, well, that means this opposition to legal recognition. But at the same time, they also say it means an opposition to unjust discrimination, which is something that you would see even in the catechism of the Catholic Church. And a lot of times, that's the kind of thing that the Catholic Church has not always done a good job of emphasizing or taking seriously about what that might mean. Now, obviously, there are ways that the Catholic Church would not consider a difference in marriage laws on just discrimination. And that's kind of a bigger can of worms. But what Pope Francis is saying is, hey, there are plenty of ways that the absence of legal protections are creating real discrimination. And that real discrimination is having a real negative effect. And so if we are a Catholic church that condemns unjust discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, 
or really on any basis, then it's time to intervene. It's time to create the structures to support that. So in that way, I see a lot of consistency with what he is saying. Um, what's interesting is that in the CDF document, there already are some nuances, some distinctions that are made, but Pope Francis obviously is going farther. And that's why I say there is a challenge to some of the things in that document. How then to interpret all of this? Um, well, on the one hand, there's definitely a different level. Uh, there are different levels of authority within the Catholic Church, and this gets spelled out by kind of systematic theologians with even greater detail than I would possibly be able to give you here. But there is something to the fact that this came out in an interview. He was talking to a reporter and was giving, you know, his interpretation. And so there is something about what he's saying as, say, I am Jorge Mario Bergoglio, the, an individual Catholic man, and what I am saying as I am Pope Francis the Pope. You're not entirely clear about all those distinctions, um, but in the Catholic Church, the way that things are structured, there's a difference between something that Pope Francis writes in an encyclical, for instance, and something that Pope Francis says in a speech. And then there's also something different to what Pope Francis says in an interview, which is even more informal. That's not to say that it can't have an impact um, in the, I'm gonna remember the year of this wrong. I, I wish I should have looked this up beforehand, but um, the Catholic church teaching on something like contraception, for instance, has actually kind of shifted over time in ways that often get masked. But um, originally the Catholic church presupposition around human sexuality was that it always had to be open to a life in a way that one could never do anything to sort of regulate the timing of one's child or one's children. But you have Pope Pius give a speech to a gathered group of Italian midwives where he says, oh, there actually could be ways to, uh, he basically articulates this vision for what he calls responsible parenthood and that it could be appropriate and necessary to try and limit the number of children that one would have and that that might mean certain ways to do that. Now, of course, in the Catholic context, that means something like natural family planning rather than an artificial form of birth control. But what you see is this development from you can't even do the natural things because you have a damaging intention to marriage to actually there's space for that. Let's just talk about how you do it. And that came about because of this address, which was a much more informal thing than if he had been writing an encyclical on contraception, which he never did. And that then shaped a subsequent encyclical Humanae Vitae articulating the church's position. So there could be a kind of similar trajectory here. And, and that's why people do latch on to things that the Pope says. I mean, even if he's talking as an individual Catholic, there's a pretty big difference between what Jorge Mario Bergoglio happens to think and what I think. You know, people are not going to care what I think to the same extent because I'm not Pope Francis. And he's Pope Francis. And I'll tell you what, he knows he's Pope Francis. And Pope Benedict did similar things. Um, he was not one to court controversy on these sorts of questions, but he was also pretty controversial in some of the things that he said in interviews. Um, rather famously, he made comments about contraception in an interview to a, a, a German author who was writing a book. And when that came out, it became a big deal and it sort of called into question some of the larger framing around the church's teachings. And I think a similar thing is happening here. So yes, it's probably true to say this is him speaking from his own perspective. You know, it's not like a papal decree, certainly. If he really wanted to make one of those, he would do it, and he would do it in a, a more formal fashion. But it's not an accident that he said this. He clearly intended to get this point across, and Catholics ought to pay heed to that as well. So that's not to minimize it, but it is to give some some sense of the, the placement of it. The other piece then, so Catholics, when they kind of think about teachings, think about what's the level of authority. And then Catholics also think about where does it fit in the larger kind of frame of things. And that's important too, because what Pope Francis says is not just an off the cuff thing that is completely random. Like I'm saying, it actually is consistent with larger themes in his own pontificate, particularly this emphasis on the dignity of all, which is really maybe the most fundamental claim that Christians make as a moral application of faith in Jesus as God incarnate as a human being. So that's really at the heart of the Catholic vision of the moral life fundamentally. And this is very much consistent with that. 
there's also a larger distinction between law and morality that's at play here. And that, that really is important because what Pope Francis is talking about in this context are the legal policies. And that's different than the moral position of the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church could support civil unions, um, same-sex civil unions, without changing any single thing in its teaching about its vision for human sexuality or marriage even. And that's kind of what Pope Francis seems to be trying to say. It's about what are these laws designed to do? And he thinks about protection. He thinks about unjust discrimination and trying to counteract that. And so he's making a judgment about policies that promote goods. And frankly, any policy is going to aim to serve a variety of goods in most cases. And so this is why Catholics in the United States will talk about the importance of prudential judgment when approaching political matters. It's not just, oh, okay, here's some teaching, therefore this is the policy. It's here's a policy, here's a concrete idea for how to handle a variety of things. What are the goods this policy promotes? How are those goods consistent with the goods that the Catholic Church upholds? And so Pope Francis is saying, there are a lot of goods that can come out of civil unions. And a lot of those goods are consistent with goods that the Catholic Church wishes to promote. So let's think about how we can promote those things. If you look back at the um, CDF document about basically all the reasons the Catholic Church would oppose civil unions for um, same-sex couples, what you see is already a kind of distinction between, in the CDF document, laws that tolerate and laws that kind of affirm, if you want to think of it in those terms. So laws that tolerate would be something like uh, laws decriminalizing same-sex relationships, and those would not have the same opposition from the Catholic Church that, say, a law providing for a civil union for same-sex couples would, because that would be a new form of legal recognition. And in the CDF vision, that's problematic. What Pope Francis seems to be saying is there needs to be a further distinction. So there's the toleration question, which gets affirmation because of the ways that it can promote dignity. There's also the sort of consistent, he continues this rejection of direct equation with marriage, but then he's saying there's a difference between gay marriage and a civil union. And so the civil union, he seems to suggest, is more like the sort of laws that tolerate and protect rather than laws that send a certain kind of moral message. And this idea that there's a difference between, say, a moral teaching and a legal principle or a legal practice is not a novel thing. This is really a position that you see in uh, certainly Thomas Aquinas, I mean, he has a kind of whole legal theory about this and describes how what somebody, what a what the tradition, because he's a Catholic, he's talking about the Catholic tradition, what the Catholic tradition recognizes as a certain moral value doesn't translate into all laws defend every single one of those values in exactly the same way. There is a way that law does something different than morality, and those two spheres have some importance. There's also a consistency with this larger message of dignity. And just think about Pope Francis kind of, I mean, this quote has made headlines, but his most famous quote, I've got to say, is who am I to judge when he was asked about um, a gay priest? And, you know, that's kind of been his his guiding message for the church, if you will, um, to maybe take a step back and think about this, some of these questions about sexual morality a little bit less. and. That's kind of the next connection that I was thinking about is that in terms of contextualizing all of this, um, it would seem to say to say like the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference, it might be time to step back a little bit from the culture war avenue around questions of gay marriage and um, think about some other questions and some other issues. It's sort of like saying this is not the hill to die on. Um, in part because of the distinctions between law and morality that I was just talking about, but also in part because of this larger question of dignity and this sort of who am I to judge mentality. And that would be very much consistent with Pope Francis's larger message about the kinds of issues that should be getting attention from the Catholic Church in the public sphere. He uh, d gave this sort of lengthy interview um, soon after he became Pope. His first public interview was with uh, the Jesuit periodicals. So there's Jesuit periodical in Rome, and he did the interview in Italian with, um, I think, Anthony Spadaro, and then it got published simultaneously across the world. And 
um, Jesuit publication. So that it got published in the United States in America magazine. And in that, he says, we cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage, and the use of contraceptive methods. That is not possible. The church's pastoral ministry cannot be obsessed with the transmission of a disjointed multitude of doctrines to be imposed insistently. And what he's really saying is the church in the world needs to be about the message of God, the love of Christ. And that message needs to be heard first and foremost. It's not about any of these specific issues. The specific issues extend from this vision of God. And when those specific issues take precedent, take priority, subsume all the bandwidth, what gets lost is the larger idea. Um, what he calls the joy of the gospel, the, the truth of life with God, that the, the positive vision that the Catholic Church is trying to project and defend. And in that sense, I think there's probably the greatest continuity with what he's saying, which is let's make less of a big deal about these things. Let's allow for the protection of life. Let's allow for the protection of the uh, reinforcement of dignity. And let's be less worried about, oh my goodness, did it you know, match up nicely with this other thing? Let's really think about the human person in front of us. And for me, that gives me a lot of hope. I think that's a, a grand vision for how to engage political life that really could be shaping a lot of our challenges in a polarized society. And so that's the last point that I wanted to kind of leave you with is, what do you do with this message and how do you think about what he's saying? And and I would just say, think about that. Think about the dignity of the human person and think about the person in front of us. Think about the humanity and think about ways to honor that. I mean, that's fundamentally what Catholicism is teaching us. And this is one way of thinking about what that application looks like. So resist the temptation to turn this into dissension. There are some who are reading this as uh, a grand schism in the Catholic Church, thus the title is the Pope Catholic. How could he say this? This is so anti-Catholic. And what I hope I've been able to give you is a sense that what he's saying is consistent with a lot of what the church is trying to promote and the goods the church is teaching and, and doesn't by any means call into question the Pope's Catholicism. You know, the traditional answer to is the Pope Catholic is yes. And I mean the title to convey that. So yes, he's He's quite on board. Um, but on the other side, I, people who wanted him to go even further and, and get frustrated by the fact that there's not this great affirmation and equation with gay marriage, for instance, or there's not this um, resounding support for adoption for same-sex couples. And I understand the frustrations, but again, resist the temptation to dissension. Think about the good that's being promoted and the, the values that are there and think about how we we can internalize and promote those things for ourselves too. So with that, I have, I'm certain, talked at you far more longer than you would have liked and in far more confusing terms than I would have liked. So I open it to your questions to help that clarity. Dr. Dempsey. Thanks very much, Connor. This has really been really helpful. As you know, I'm in charge of the Department of Theology social media, so our Twitter account and well, it was basically Twitter that I was seeing this on. So I was aware as I checked, you know, our social media um, that there was a kerfluffle out there, but I hadn't really had time to um, to investigate. So this is really helpful. Thanks. Um, you know, and it might be because I'm a U.S. citizen, and I'm accustomed, let's say, if such a kerfluffle happened in something that one of our political candidates had said, uh, and there was an uproar, that political candidate would immediately respond, right, and have something else to say. So, you know, and I, I think this seems to be something that Pope Francis has done before. He doesn't necessarily return to, um, you know, he, some, there's some controversy over something he's said, um, but he's not going to go back and um, revisit that. Do you think that's because, well, of what you said, it's for him, it's consistent. It's not a hill that we need to die on, um, you know, that he, he hasn't come back to address um, the controversy that's arisen about this. 
Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. I think that's certainly part of it. Um, he doesn't want to call attention to the kinds of things that um, might usurp our focus and take the bandwidth away from the larger questions that he wants us to pay attention to. So it's kind of, look, this is consistent with what I've been saying. It's consistent with those larger themes. Don't distract yourself from the larger themes that we're really trying to reaffirm. The other piece that I think is important is his kind of vision for himself as the leader of the church. And he has a very particular emphasis on collegiality, um, which is to say he kind of sees a greater equality for himself, even as Pope, in connection with the other bishops. So his um, preferred term of art for his position is not, I am Pope Francis, but that he is the Bishop of Rome which is officially what the Pope is, is a Bishop of Rome. And that's intentionally, it seems, designed to kind of call attention to the ways that he is the leader of this Catholic Church as the Bishop of Rome. That's the Bishop of Rome's position, because that person is also the Pope. But he's a leader who does not lead in isolation. Um, so what I think you see him doing, and this would be true in other cases, I think first and foremost about uh, Amoris Laetitia, which generated an awful lot of controversy when it came out for a footnote that suggested that divorced and remarried Catholics might be able to come back to the Eucharist even without first processing an annulment, for instance, or something like that. And there was an enormous amount of controversy around all of that, an enormous amount of confusion, and the footnote itself had some ambiguity to it, which seemed sort of intentional to some degree. Um, and I think Pope Francis's decision in that case not to intervene was meant to allow people to work with this document as a message from the Bishop of Rome that other bishops think about how to apply in their immediate areas. So he seems much more willing to tolerate greater variation in the application of certain norms and principles across the Catholic Church than had been the case in his immediate predecessors, for instance. I think both John Paul II and Pope Benedict were pretty insistent on this is the line and everybody's going to follow the line. And I think Pope Francis tends to have more of a, here's the vision, you all figure out how you're going to implement it. His decision then not to kind of clarify and intervene seems to reinforce that. Um, yeah, Jen. Um, I'm just laughing because that was the question I was going to ask, actually, in terms of his follow-up. But I do have another question. Maybe it's more just food for thought. I can't, if it's true at all of what you said about the, the church, perhaps, or, or maybe Pope Francis himself not wanting to, or kind of separating themselves a little bit from those culture wars, yeah. you have to wonder if not the interview in 2019, but subsequent kinds of things in the last several months, for example, you know, if there was ever if there's an intentionality uh, around all the, the stuff around race issues and equity issues and justice issues, if, if there was, if, I don't know if you have a thought about that, if maybe there was an intentional uh, reminder maybe, or stepping into that sense of human dignity in all of its facets. Does that make sense? I, I don't know. Maybe yeah. that's not giving too much credit or too much purpose <laughs> to that statement, but. No, but I think what's what's striking as well, Jen, is this is coming out now because it's in a movie that was being made. And it's sort of like, yeah. think about the genesis of this. I mean, I think this project was years in the making. If I remember correctly, um, the document documentarian first approached the Vatican when um, Archbishop Viganò was the spokesperson for the Vatican. And that's, I mean, that's been a long time and there's been a big rift between Pope Francis and Viganò rally publicly. So, um, it's been a while in the making. And that's important because we have not seen much from Pope Francis recently, mainly due to the coronavirus pandemic. So he's been kind of social distancing as we're all supposed to be doing. And that has diminished his public presence. And so what we've seen here in this documentary and, and this quote kind of grabbing the headlines is this came out because it had already been said. So mm -hmm. we've got to keep that kind of context in mind um, when we think about well, where's the the voice and the focus on the kind of immediate challenges in front of us? It's like, well, this is an immediate challenge, but it's also 2019 Pope Francis talking to 2020 situations. So I would say if you try and keep track of the points where he has intervened, I think he has been kind of judicious in where he has decided to make a public statement in some way or another. Um, so he has made some comments about the 
questions of racial justice in the United States. I mean, he's given some explicit statements um, in the aftermath of George Floyd over the summer, for instance. But he's also done some writing. And so where he has kind of given a public voice, it's been with that weight of authority as I am Pope Francis. And the illustration would be his recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which emphasizes very much the kinds of concerns you're, you're identifying here and that broader perspective that needs to be taken on the pursuit of justice. I mean, it's it's about being related to all. It's it's really a document, uh, it's really an encyclical about solidarity fundamentally and what that means and how we need to embrace that solidarity to begin to change some of those structures. And, and there are references in there to racism and an indictment of racism that comes pretty vociferously and pretty emphatically, which may the, the church as a whole and its leaders take heed, um, really. Thanks. Something that Deirdre had mentioned prompted me to remember another piece of the context that I wanted to give, which is you had said, Deirdre, you know, part of it is your U.S. perspective. And when we read this from the U.S. perspective, as I say, it would sort of his comments about civil unions, this would be a, a step back legally for where the U.S. is right now. Um, and that's a comment that um, Tom Reese, a Jesuit theologian and analyst made in um, the National Catholic Reporter. But he also emphasizes the ways that Pope Francis isn't talking to the United States. I mean, first of all, he gave this interview to a, a TV reporter from Mexico, and it was a message that was going to go to the whole world. So what that becomes really important because there are plenty of countries where this message, even as a kind of small step for the Catholic Church, has a really big impact. So think about um, countries in Africa where same-sex relationships are illegal and where you could not just be like arrested, but potentially killed for um, being seen to have a, a same-sex relationship. In that context, statement about saying, what about protecting through a, a civil union. I mean, that goes even further than what the church has been able to say up to this point in protecting the rights of men and women who have been attacked for their sexual orientation. And so from that perspective, it, it really is a big deal. And that's important to keep in mind that, you know, it's easy to read statements from the Pope through our lens in the United States and our immediate context. We, we all sort of have our immediate context. This is something our Ignatian pedagogy reinforces for us. And that shapes how we experience things and what we encounter. But there's a global reference point to what the Pope does as the leader, and this can have a really big impact globally on particularly these themes about justice and dignity, really. I forgot also to say, Connor, thank you, because this has been really helpful for foods for thought and thinking through some things and maybe some clarification on timing and context and everything. So I appreciate it. But I'm glad. It's been interesting to see the reactions. Um, there's been quite a range uh, among the sort of Catholic media, if you will. I can only imagine what the reactions look like on Catholic Twitter, which is a place that I don't go because I think it might be the ninth circle of hell, um, which is reserved for traitors, as I understand, um, which is to say not like traitors to the cause, but just betrayal of somebody else. Um, and I think that's that's often the case on the Twitterverse, but there have been quite the string, shall we say. Um, and I hope the context helps to navigate some of that. Gosh, I feel bad. I should have come with just more to say the whole time. All you wanted to do was hear me. Oh, that's so nice of you. Have people been thinking about this? I mean, how many of you have seen the quote or, or knew about this coming into the conversation today? And how many of you were just like, is the pub Catholic? I've been wanting to know all this time. That's really what I was worried about. I can't help but wonder to what extent a, uh, a place like Marquette would be willing to, and maybe it's complicated by COVID and everything being online, but you know, to really host more dialogue around this because it seems like it should be part of the conversation, right? As part of our identity in a institution of higher ed and deeply thinking about these issues, it would be nice to think we could have a, a, a more conversation about it. Yeah, and I think that's a place where the international connection becomes important again because it's easy 
in the US, for instance, to look at this and say, well, it's already settled law here. Um, and, you know, I understand their questions about potential Supreme Court revis revisiting and all of that, especially in the context of um, this case I mentioned about adoption agencies. But I think for by and large, there's a, a sense from most ordinary Catholics of like, this is it, this is where it's at. There's not, there's not much to debate about um, same-sex civil unions, for instance, and what that might mean. But to think about what it might do internationally is important and some of the effects that that has in the larger context of the global church. But even in the US, I think there is something to be said about what does it mean to take cues from Pope Francis on this? What does it mean to think about the idea that something like a civil union law is designed to protect people? It's designed to affirm the inherent dignity and, and ensure that people have access to the things that they need to realize that dignity. Because you have Catholic institutions that would say, well, even with legal recognition for gay marriage, we're not comfortable with providing certain kinds of benefits in certain contexts. And we'd really be iffy about all of that. Or you see the kind of like contorting that goes on to say, well, here's why we're able to do this and not violate this and all of that. Whereas I think Pope Francis is really trying to say, let's take a step back. Let's stop worrying about those things. Let's focus on the fact that we're trying to protect dignity and, and honor that. And you know, yeah, that could I, be I easy. Actually think I would, I would, I, well, I don't know if you disagree, but you know, I think we have a lot of conversations still to be had in the United States, irregardless of any Supreme Court decision as it relates to Catholic identity. I mean, you know, there are still schools that will deny access to a student with two same-sex parents. So they, this idea that because we have, even beyond civil unions, we have the ability to, you know, for gay marriage, I don't think presumes that there isn't a lot of discussion and dialogue to be had about that sense of solidarity and human dignity as it relates to this topic about, you know, being in the church. There are Catholic churches that wouldn't want necessarily somebody with a family, for example, and, and wouldn't honor it in an in equal way. So, you know, I actually sadly think, I wish it were different, but sadly think there's a lot of space for us to have that conversation about, um, yeah, that, that dignity part is just huge, you know? Yeah, and I think it would be an easy way to for the church to begin to say, look, we don't have to have all of these disputes about, oh, well, is it cooperation with evil in a material and not a formal sense? And am I doing this and that and the right. other thing? We just say like, no, we recognize the dignity of every human being and therefore we yep. want you to have health care. Boom. That's it. Stamp of approval. End of conversation. Like, yeah. why, why are we fighting about it? But you're right. We are fighting about that still. Yeah, and it's particularly still. true. You made a good point. It's particularly true for employees of Catholic churches and Catholic parishes. Right. Uh, a lot of times Catholic institutions like schools, universities, um, will be kind of clearer on trying to hew to the the legal standards because of the fact that they're not, you know, they're religiously affiliated, but they're not a religion in the same way that a Catholic parish is like a religious institution as a mm -hmm. representative of the Catholic church and therefore begins to say, well, look, we should have exemptions to certain things because we're professing our faith in all that we do in a way that often a university would say like, the faith is central to us as an institution, but we're also an institution and bound by the law because we do something more than just evangelize or whatever. Um, yeah, I think you're right about that. So may it reinforce the importance of dignity and, and of honoring that. And Amanda, I should probably hand it over to you. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, since we just have like two minutes left, I was just gonna thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Connor, for speaking. And we have a soup event next Wednesday at noon, same place on Microsoft Teams. And the topic for that event is global social justice implications for US foreign policy. And then I'm just gonna quickly put in the chat ways to sign up for a weekly email list if you're not on it yet. So thank you again. Great, thanks for having me. Thanks everyone, thanks Connor. Thanks Amanda. Yeah, thanks. Thank you Connor, this was great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.